In the previous lesson, we introduced the ovarian cycle. Now let's get to know it really well. We will go over all the stages of the follicle maturation, from the primordial follicle to the corpus luteum. And to keep it simple, let's not trouble ourselves with the regulation of the cycle, at least not for now, because we'll cover the hormones that regulate the cycle in a separate lesson. As you can see, we have our ovary here. And what we're going to do is start right here at the beginning of the ovarian cycle, which we will call day zero. We will work our way through the stages until the end of the cycle, which in our case is day 28. So let's get started. At the beginning of the ovarian cycle, 15 to 20 primordial follicles begin maturation, making their way to ovulation. But not all of them will be so lucky to reach ovulation because uh, in fact, only one oocyte will be ovulated in most cycles. The other follicles will degenerate along the way in a process called atresia, turning them into atretic follicles. The primordial follicles that survive the first step are called early primary follicles. And at this stage, we see a transformation of the follicular cells. They change from squamous cells to cuboidal cells. And we can see them here. As the cycle continues, the primary follicles grow larger and larger and experience quite a few changes. Let's go over them one by one. First, the follicular cells proliferate and form a few rows of cells called granulosa cells. This entire structure of cells is called stratum granulosum. Then the granulosa cells and the oocyte begin to secrete certain glycoproteins that form a layer between them. And this layer is called the zona pellucida which literally means the transparent zone. Now, the zona pellucida plays quite an important role in fertilization, and we'll talk more about it in future videos. Also, you might have noticed that the zona pellucida separates the primary oocyte from its surrounding granulosa cells, and that makes it quite difficult for the oocyte to, to receive its nutrients. Now, to solve this problem, the granulosa cells send these finger-like processes through the zona pellucida to reach the oocyte and, and basically feed it. Lastly, we see a change in the cells surrounding the follicle. These cells are actually part of the connective tissue of the ovary and they're called stromal cells. The stromal cells begin to organize themselves around the follicle and form a layer called the theca folliculi, which you can see here in red. Theca means case, and well, that kind of makes sense because you can see it encases the follicle. When we see these features, the follicle is considered to be a late primary follicle. As the cycle continues, the granulosa cells also continue to proliferate and enlarge the follicle. These granulosa cells also begin to secrete fluids into the space between them and form a vesicle, which you can see here. This vesicle is called an antrum. And when this antrum appears, the follicle is considered to be a secondary follicle. When the antrum appears, a new feature also arises. This little mound of granulosa cells, which you can see right here, is pushed into the antrum. This group of cells is called cumulus oophorus, and it literally means a heap of eggs, which you gotta admit is a super cool name. Yet another change we see at this stage is the differentiation of the theca folliculi, which we met just a few moments ago. This layer differentiates into two separate layers, the theca interna and the theca externa. The theca interna is a very important layer. Firstly, it is highly vascularized in order to supply the follicle with the nutrients it requires. Secondly, it plays a very important role in hormone secretion, which we'll talk more about in the future. The theca externa plays a different role. It has the ability to contract. And this ability to contract will be quite important when we reach ovulation. When we reach the end of the secondary follicle stage, the oocyte itself also goes through a change. It finally wakes up from its arrested state. It completes meiosis 1, enters meiosis 2, but once again is arrested. This time at metaphase 2. Now the oocyte is known as a secondary oocyte. Notice that after the first meiotic division, we still only have one oocyte. So what happened to the other oocyte? Well, during the cell division, one cell gets almost all the cytoplasm and becomes the secondary oocyte, 
while the other cell gets practically nothing and becomes this tiny cell known as a polar body. The polar body serves no function and will eventually degenerate and disappear. Now let's get back to the follicle. The granulosa cells continue to secrete fluids, causing the antrum to grow, as we can see here. The follicle we see here is known as a graphene follicle, and it is defined as a follicle after meiosis I and before ovulation. This is the dominant follicle. Okay, from now on we only have one follicle, or usually we only have one follicle. From the dominant follicle, the ovulate oocyte will originate. Okay, so it means that we're getting closer to day 14, which is the, the day of ovulation. And now we see that the follicle is pushed against the surface of the ovary. As a last step before ovulation, the secondary oocyte, together with the cumulus oophorus and the rest of the surrounding granulosa cells, detach from the follicle and float inside the antrum. Now the structure of cells that now surrounds the floating oocyte is called the corona radiata which means the radiating crown. How majestic. Soon after the detachment, ovulation happens. The follicle ruptures and allows the oocyte to be ejected from the ovary. And in order to help the ejection of the oocyte, the ovary itself, as well as the theca externa, contract and give it a little push. Once the oocyte is out of the ovary with the, with the help of these tentacle-like fimbria, which you can see here, it enters the fallopian tube, where it potentially can be fertilized. Please remember that ovulation occurs at day 14 in the case of a 28-day cycle. Now, if the cycle is shorter or longer than 28 days, ovulation will not occur at day 14, rather 14 days before the end of the cycle, as you can see on the diagram here. So, now we've passed ovulation, but we still have 14 more days to go. So, let's see what happens next. The granulosa cells and the theca interna cells of the ruptured follicle differentiate. They turn into cells called lutein cells. And these lutein cells form a structure called the corpus luteum, or yellow body. And as we've mentioned in the previous lesson, the corpus luteum has some very important functions. For now, it is enough to know that the corpus luteum is essential for the maintenance of the growing embryo and the uterus. It is also important to know that the future of the corpus luteum depends on the event of fertilization. Now let's explain. In case the ovulate oocyte was fertilized and implanted in the uterus, the corpus luteum will persist and grow bigger and bigger to support the embryo. However, in case fertilization did not occur, which is the more likely option, there is no need for the corpus luteum. So it degenerates and becomes a structure known as corpus albicans meaning the white body. The structure serves no function, so it will simply disappear over time. Congratulations, we have now reached day 28 and completed our cycle. In the next video, we will review the cycle once more, and this time focus on the roles that hormones play.